trade. It's why we have so much communication with each other. It's the reason why we live the way we do today. In fact, companies didn't realize that they could 100x, 200x their companies simply by going overseas. And when the internet came and made it so easy that we realized that it's always been the key to life. That's why most countries around the world don't spend most of their time worrying about foreigners and what the problem with foreigners is. In fact, everybody's trying to create harmony between themselves and other people. Otherwise, we would live in the same colonization hellhole that we lived in a couple hundred years ago. No trade is more important than the one that happened in the Indian Ocean. Maybe the one that happened in the Atlantic Ocean, but we'll see. Let's first think about the people who lived in the Indian Ocean. We have the Egyptians trading through the Indian Ocean, the Ethiopians, the Indians, the Arabs, the Indonesians, and all the others. We have actual writing from people who talk about these trade routes and these trade times. And I've gone through some of these before, but never in an extensive full video. And I think that's very important for us to do, to sit down and talk about why it's important to not ignore the Indian Ocean and its trade routes. Now, I want us to first start with something very important which is how far away is two parts of the world for example Ethiopia and China they're quite far from each other now being far doesn't mean they will never contact each other for example many Chinese scholars would be fully aware of stuff that came from Africa because they would run into it in the Middle East they would look up at it and think, where the hell did that giraffe come from? Pictures like these should remind us that there was deep travel all over the world and people in China and Africa everywhere were quite curious about places. In fact, if we read from Ibn Battuta about China, we will see that his curiosity, even though he was an African, was too much. And when he got to China, he detailed things, and remember, this is what I was saying about the dictionary from the Kingdom of Congo, there's always a slip of perspective, a sudden change in perspective when you get someone who's not from a specific area telling you about that area. For example, what Marco Polo is going to say about China is going to be very different than someone who grew up in Africa. And this is very important information, not for any other reason, but the fact that we get multiple confirmation of single points. And this is what we're going to get from these people. Because of a concept called 100 percentism, some people will roll their eyes when they hear the word Ibn Battuta and think, isn't that just another Arab trader? Nope. He definitely was not, because he was an African. He was an Arab, but so were a lot of Africans. And he was a speaker of the Arabic language, and he was a practitioner of Islam. But that changes nothing in the fact that you can have a completely different perspective than anybody else in the world. No matter what Ibn Battuta looked like, keep in mind, this is a true African's perspective. This guy came directly from North West Africa. And he had kinship, he had friendship with other people who were in Africa. In fact, in his homeland, he states that there were black Africans, and some of them accompanied him around the world. So... Remember, this is a true African perspective. When you read what he says, he's comparing it to his own country, which easy trade was with other Africans. 
Now, of course, before you can even go to China, you have to go through places like the Middle East. And in fact, here he goes through Turkey where the Turkmen are. Now, remember, the Turkmen are spread through a wide range of the Middle East, going from Russia, Turkey, and all the way to China. But this is what he had to say. The city of Alalaya that we have mentioned is a place on the sea coast. It is inhabited by Turkmens and is visited by the merchants of Cairo, Alexandria, and Syria. It has quantities of wood, which is exported from there to Alexandria and Dimyat, and thence carried to the other parts of Egypt. There is at the top of the town a magnificent and formidable citadel built by the illustrious Sultan Ala al din al-Rumi. I met in the city its Qadi Jalal al-Din al-Arzanjani. He went up to the citadel with me on Friday when we performed the prayers there and treated me with generous hospitality. I was hospitably entertained there also by Shams al-Din ibn al-Rajihani, whose father, Allah al-Din, died at Mali in the Negro lands. Well, what can we draw from that? Well, first of all, we can draw that traveling from one part of the earth to the other was something that was difficult but not impossible at the time. In fact, we see just people who are born elsewhere dying in random places around the world, and we see all kinds of stuff like that, of people traveling and trading and doing all kinds of things that would make it very common and obvious at the time. But here's a humorous statement. Well, I find it funny because, you know, a lot of people like to make it seem like this guy was like some deep Muslim who didn't have an ego. But this is what he had to say about one of the greatest travelers of his time. I met in the city the pious Sheikh Abdallah al-Misri, the traveler and a man of saintly life. He journeyed through the earth. But he never went into China, nor the island of Ceylon, nor the Maghreb, nor Al-Andalus, nor the Negrolands, so that I have outdone him by visiting these regions. See, you see there that he makes it very obvious that he takes great pride in the fact that he has traveled these places. And he talks about people now... Keep in mind, Abdallah al-Misri is probably mixed race. Probably half Buja and half Arab. But we'll talk about that later in another part where he speaks. I hope so far I've made it quite obvious to you that I'm going to talk about the journey with black Africans traveling with him. And traveling very far with him all the way to China and India and places like that. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that he himself, as a traveler, is needing permission to travel these places. He's not just some guy who just disrespectfully gets on boats and moves. And they, wherever he goes, he needs the permission of the locals. And so, of course, he starts in the Negrolands because why? He's from the Negrolands. He's from Morocco which was one of the Negrolands that he writes down. So we're backing up a little here. We're going to talk about people like the Ethiopians and stuff before we start talking about how he traveled out. So remember, we let's talk about Asia Minor, which is the Turkish areas. Then talk about Arabia Felix, which is Yemen. This is going to be important because this is how they're written down, the names. And then the Buja, which are the Beja. Now remember, this happened in the 1300s, which 300 years later in the 1600s, the Portuguese would travel to the exact same spot and then need the same assistance of these people. So this guy needs the assistance of these Africans to travel to Asia Minor and to Arabia Felix and to India the same way that the other people who came in, the Europeans who came in, needed the assistance of these people because these people understood the winds of the areas. They, were, they weren't just standing there. From Upper Egypt, its inhabitants are the Buja, black-skinned people who wrap themselves in yellow blankets and tie headbands. 
each about a finger breadth wide, round their heads. They give daughters no share in their inheritance. Their food is camel's milk, and they ride on Mari dramedies, which they call by the name of Sub. One third of the city belongs to the Sultan of Egypt, Al Malik Al Nasser, and two thirds to the king of the Buja, who is called Al Hadrabi. In the town of Idab, there is a mosque attributed to Al Castalini, famous for its blessed power. I saw it and visited it to profit by its blessing. In this town, too, live the pious Sheikh Musa and the aged Sheikh Muhammad al Marrakesh, who declares that he is the son of the al Martuda the king of Marrakesh, and that he is ninety-five years of age. On reaching Idub, we found that al-Hadrabi, the sultan of the Buja, was engaged in hostilities with the Turks, that he had sunk their ships, and the Turks had fled before him. It is impossible for us to make the sea crossing, so we sold the provisions that we had made ready and returned to Upper Egypt with the Arabs from whom we had hired the camels. Arrived back at the town of Kus, which has already been mentioned, we sailed thence down the Nile. It was the flood season, and after a passage of eight nights of Ku from Kus, arrived at Cairo. Very interesting for me that these black inhabitants play such an important role but if you were to google what role black people played during the 1300s in the middle east or middle eastern related cities they would say nothing when we know that they were in arabia felix asia minor and all places in fact i read to you the other time which i'm not going to put it in this one about the black inhabitant negro who was all the way in persia but we have more important business to tend to because we're about to talk about him moving from Arabia into these areas, moving from Africa into the Arabian areas, and then hopefully for him into India because only when he did that he could brag that he had traveled from the Negrolands all the way to China. When the pilgrimage ended, I went to Judah with the intention of sailing to al Yamin and India, but that was not decreed for me. I was unable to find a companion, and I stayed in Judah about forty days. There was a ship there belonging to a man called Abdallah al Tunisia, who was intending to go to al Qusr in the government of Qus. So I boarded it to see what state it was in. But it did not please me, and I disliked the idea of traveling by it. This was an act of providence of God most high. For the ship sailed, and when it was in an open sea, it foundered at a place called Raz Abu Muhammad. Its master and some merchants escaped in a ship's boat after severe distress and were and were on the point of death even some of these perished and all the rest were drowned including about 70 of the pilgrims who were on it some time later i sailed to sumbak for idab but the wind drove us back to roadstide called raz dawar and from there we travelled by the land with the Buja. We made our way through the desert full of ostriches and gazelles, and inhabited by Arabs of Juwana and Banu Kahil, who are subject to the Buja, and reached a water point called Mufr, and another called Ja al Jadid. Since our provisions were exhausted, we purchased sheep 
from some of the Buja whom we found in the wilderness and prepared a store of their flesh. Long story short, they accompanied him to Asia Minor. But there's something else that is important about this story, which is you can see here that Arabs keep moving from one place to another. The king of the son of the king of Marrakesh is in upper in lower Egypt. The random person is here, this other person is here in another part that I'm not gonna show. People are learning in Syria who are from Egypt, people are learning from Egypt who are in Syria. It's just a thing of travel back and forth. And this is why it was possible for someone like this, this African, to travel all the way to places like China. You even saw there that there was another traveler whose name was Al Tunis from Tunisia who was traveling and was going to accompany him through the thing until his boat kind of floundered and died. But you can see that there's a guy from Tunisia, who, which is close to where Morocco is. Uh, but what's he doing here, trying to travel the world as well? A different person from the same similar location. So I, that's why I laugh when people say that in Arabia it was just this thing where only a thousand people moved into North Africa. No, that didn't happen. Of course he went through Persia, because of course Persia is close to India. And when he was in Persia, he saw the coal black Negro. But then when he was also in Persia he met another person who is called the black and his name was Ahmad al-Dinwari Sheikh Ahmad al-Dinwari who if we read it says Abdallah Amwa he it was who was the disciple of the Sheikh Ahmad al-Dinwari the black without any intervening person but God knows best the person who became the disciple of Aku Faraj al Zanjini Zinjani was Abdallah b Muhammad b Abdallah, the father of Abdal Najib. The many islands in between Africa and India connect them. One of them is called the Maldives. These Maldives, in the section called Southern Arabia, East Africa, and the Persian Gulf, talks about a trade where you find East Africans, the Maldives, and Indians playing a role. And it says, the coconut, especially that in the island of Dibat al-Mahal, or the Maldives, is the size of a human head. And they tell this story. A certain philosopher in India in past ages was in the service of the kings and was held by high esteem. When large quantities of this sap has collected for him he cooks it in the same way as grape juice is cooked when he rubs and made it and makes a delicious honey and great utility and this is brought by merchants of india al yemen and china who transport it to their countries and manufacture sweet meats from it now i want you to remember a couple things about this specific area Abraha, remember, in the 6th century, took over Yemen for the Christian king of Ethiopia and refused to give back the kingdom, instead ruling by himself. But this was one of the times, it's not the only, because I just read to you right there about the Be the Buja as well, which are the Beja. You see this a lot, this slip of alphabet this is why it's interesting to get it from multiple angles but to go straight to what they talk about you get the bourgeois you get the sixth century people since the sixth century the ethiopians so there's been ethiopians in yemen forever and by the time this is happening ethiopians are basically typical in yemen and so when you say that the maldives was frequented by these people. Remember, Yemen is right next to Somalia. It's right next to the Abyssinian regions. And this trade between all three of them would have definitely touched Ethiopia. Not to mention that um, there's places like Aramata where the Indians used to trade there anyway. So 
we're talking about a large network of trade which includes these random islands right in the middle and of course this is only one person which i'm not going to go into the other people today because there's like 10 or 20 books on other islamists who talk about trade going throughout the entire region of the indian ocean okay so this is just part one but i will make a part two and i hope i can make it one hour long but every time i try to do something one hour i realize that there's more important things to talk about but for now i want you to know that at some point when ibn batuta goes to the maldives he has to rescue or intercede in the case of a negro slave and that's how you know that there were some negroes in that area people don't even know what people from maldives are because they haven't been investigated that well we know that they speak an indo-european language